Happy New Year. And welcome to this morning's worship service, a very special welcome if you happen to be a guest or a visitor with us today. We're delighted to have you with us. If you are from the Prescott area, you don't already have a church home, please come back, worship with us again. Consider making American Lutheran Church your church home. A couple announcements. Um, kind of excited. We have the... Uh, most of you, well, many, I don't know, some of you might know that uh, we celebrate our 75th anniversary this year, American Lutheran Church, as a congregation in Prescott, Arizona. And so uh, later this spring, we'll be having a, a, some sort of a big hoedown celebration sort of a thing. Um, but today we're offering you, uh, one per family, please, uh, our 75th anniversary calendar gift. So uh, if you haven't already picked one up, please pick one up today. Um, they'll have a table out in the narthex so that you can get your calendar. Keep that in mind. Uh, WOW is going to be beginning, be beginning January 11th. So registration next week uh, will continue. Um, annual congregational meetings coming up. I know you've all been waiting eagerly for that. And uh, so mark your calendars now for Sunday, January 29th at noon. Um, and uh, I have been asked to let you know that the Genesis Connections class is going to begin on January 29th. And I think at one time we might have had it down for January 8th or something like that. So please, if you're planning on taking that class, um, remark your calendars for January 29th. I want to thank some folks for Altar Flowers today. Jeff and Marty Bernatz's 56th anniversary. Are you here today, Jeff? Congratulations. And I did see D. D. Ray and D. Isham's 44th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Uh, we thank uh, Pat Shepard for Altar Flowers today in celebration of Kathy's 80th birthday. Also, I want to remind you the prayer team is available at the conclusion of today's service. If you have a prayer need, just gather here at the end of the worship service today at the altar rail closest to the pulpit. One of our prayer ministers will be glad to meet you, greet you, and to share a prayer with you this morning. With that, I want to invite you to stand as you are able. We'll quiet our minds, we'll center our hearts, and prepare to come into the worship of our Lord. We gather today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sins. God of life, you promise good news of great joy for all people and call us to be messengers of your peace. We confess that too often we bore our joy, our resources, and our security. We nurture conflict and build barriers. We neglect the needs of our neighbors and ignore the groaning of creation. Have mercy on us. Where we are self-centered, open our hearts. Where we are reluctant, give us courage. Where we are cynical, restore our trust. Renew us with your grace and give us again the hope of eternal life in you. Amen. Hear the good news. We are children of God and heirs of God's promises through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus, we are forgiven and redeemed. Sing with joy, for all the ends of the earth shall know the salvation of God. Amen.
light that enlightens everyone has come into the world. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. O oh Lord God, you know that we cannot place our trust in our own powers. As you protected the infant Jesus, so defend us and all the needy from harm and adversity. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. reading is from Isaiah chapter 63. 
I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us, and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely, and he became their savior in all their distress. It was no messenger or angel, but his presence that saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. We will read Psalm 148 responsively. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise the Lord, all you angels. Sing praise, all you hosts of heaven. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Sing praise, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded, and they were created, who made them stand fast forever and ever, giving them a law that shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps fire and hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind doing God's will, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world, young men and maidens, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name only is exalted, whose splendor is over earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up strength for the people and praise for all faithful servants. The children of Israel are people who are near the Lord. Hallelujah. Please stand. The Holy Gospel for this first Sunday in the church season of Christmas is from St. Matthew, the second chapter. Lord. Now, after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and the angel said to Joseph, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For King Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up. He took the child and his mother by night, and they fled to Egypt. And they remained in Egypt. Uh, and they remained there until the death of King Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now when King Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And so King Herod sent and, uh, and killed um, all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. And when King Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when Joseph heard that Archelaus, who is the son of King Herod, when he heard that he was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, 
Joseph went away to the district of Galilee. And there Joseph made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, that he, meaning the Messiah, will be called a Nazarene. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And uh, again, I say Happy New Year to you all. And uh, I pray it's off to a good start and uh, that it will continue to be a blessing to you. Uh, However, I do want to look back just for a moment uh, uh, to a week ago. Uh, to Christmas, so I'm going to open with a Christmas poem on this, the first and only Sunday among the 12 days following Christmas. Happens that way sometimes, so this is it. Sometimes we get uh, two Sundays in the season of Christmas, this year only one. So this is um, the day after Christmas. I realize We're a week out now, but I think you can work it out in your heads. The day after Christmas. Twas the day after Christmas when all through the place there was whining and bickering. Even mom had a long face. Oh, the stockings hung empty. The house was a mess. The clothes didn't fit. Dad, way too stressed. The parents were irritable. The children were not pleased. The instructions for the swing set were written in Chinese. (laughs) The bells no longer jingled. The carolers, no carolers came around. The sink was stacked with dishes. The tree already turning brown. The stores were full of people returning things that failed. Shoppers, they were discouraged. They'd paid full price. Now everything is on sale. Oh, it was the day after Christmas. Joy had disappeared. The only hope on the horizon were football games on New Year's. And so we do have football games today. Welcome to worship on this, the first Sunday after Christmas. This year, it falls on New Year's Day. There is no overflow seating in houses of worship today, not today, not the Sunday after Christmas. A week ago, we had candlelight and silent night. One week later, in today's gospel reading, we are already witnessing the darker side of Christmas. Could there be such a thing? A darker side of Christmas? How can this be? Well, if we look at the Christmas story, we will see light and darkness. And in the Christmas story, we will see good and evil. It just depends on where we want to put our emphasis and our focus and when we do. And nobody can blame us on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day when we focus on the light and the good. But it's all there. It's all in the story. Here at American Lutheran Church, We lit candles on Christmas Eve. And as we lit those candles, the light, we read from John's Gospel, the first chapter, which is interestingly uh, John's Christmas story. Also one we don't tend to focus in on a lot because that's the one about, you know, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and all that. Um, We call that particular gospel reading, 1 John, the gospel of the incarnation. And as is tradition here at American Lutheran Church, as we read from John chapter 1, that's when we pass the candlelight throughout the congregation as we prepare to sing 
silent night. That gospel of the incarnation, though, is important because it is John's Christmas story, and this is John's story. In him, he's talking about Jesus, the one who will be the word made flesh. John writes, in him was the light of the world. That light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. Right there in John's Christmas story, it is light and darkness, good and evil. Right from the beginning of Jesus' birth, there is the darkness. Satan is there. He's determined to extinguish the light, who is Jesus. Because you see, if Satan can extinguish the light, all that warmth. Remember how you felt uh, at New Year's Eve if you were here with the candlelights and you're singing Silent Night and it's that moment when your heart is filled with so much hope and so much joy. Don't think for a minute that that made Satan happy. And he was bound and determined from that moment that he would find some way to rob you of that joy and that happiness. Light and darkness, good and evil, right there from the beginning. Satan knows that if he can eliminate the light, then he will eliminate our hope. Because the light is our hope in the midst of the darkness. And hope is absolutely necessary. It's absolutely critical. Hope is necessary because it is hope that sustains us on the journey, which is appropriate that we talk about that today because today we begin a New Year's journey. Yeah, the old journey's continuing, but there's always something about January 1st, the beginning of the new year. The hope is reborn, just like it is in my heart every year as the Chicago Bears <laughs> prepare to play their first game. This will be the year. Yeah. <laughs> you see, though, how important hope is. It's what sustains us as we journey from cradle to grave and beyond. Hope is necessary. It's critical. Nobody understands that better than Satan. So there you have John's gospel, light and darkness. We said, well, what about the other gospels? Well, uh, Marx is pretty weak um, when you, when you t talk about the Christmas story. Um, no, uh, there's, there's only a couple that kind of really fit the, the mark for us here, and that is Luke and Matthew. And uh, in both Luke and Matthew, again, we see light and we see darkness. Um, and, and this contrast between Luke's Christmas story and Matthew's Christmas story, that contrast could not be more stark. Maybe you've noticed it, maybe you haven't. Luke, Luke's story, that's the one we tell every Christmas. Luke's story is the story that every Sunday school Christmas pageant since the beginning of time, since the beginning of Christ, has been based upon. Luke's is the story that's worthy of, of, of a Christmas Eve worship service. Matthew, on the other hand paints a very different scene than Luke. Matthew's Christmas story. No angel visits Mary. Right? An angel shows up, but he visits Joseph. He's there to, to not encourage Mary, but to tell Joseph, don't dump her. Okay, well, that's, that's at least it's a positive. But in Matthew's Christmas story... The Holy Family suddenly finds itself far from Nazareth in Bethlehem. But there's no explanation. Why are they in Bethlehem? 
Nothing in Matthew's Christmas story about Caesar and the census and, you know, and, and, and going to the place of your, your family heritage, Bethlehem being the place, the city of David and all that connection, all that, none of that. It's just all of a sudden the Holy Family shows up in Bethlehem. There is in Matthew's gospel no innkeeper. There is no stable. There is no manger. In Matthew's Christmas story, there are no shepherds watching their flocks by night. There are no angels singing glory to God in the highest. Not in Matthew's gospel. No, in Matthew's gospel, we get less than two dozen verses into the divine drama. And what do we find? We find the holy family running for their very lives. Running, fleeing, trying to escape a murderous king, King Herod, trying to escape his attempt to snuff out the light. The angel of the Lord appears to Joseph. Go now. Flee, Joseph. Flee with Mary, with the baby. Go to Egypt, for that is my place of refuge for you. In Matthew's Christmas story, King Herod, he, he holds a central role. He does what any insecure, jealous, paranoid, maniacal king does whenever he feels threatened. King Herod goes on a murderous rampage. In Matthew's Christmas story, innocent babies are slaughtered in their homes, in the streets, in their mother's arms, slaughtered by soldiers that King Herod sent so that King Herod can sleep better at night not having to worry about anybody threatening his throne. Let's face it. There is good reason why most Christmas pageants are not based on Matthew's Christmas story. Right? This is not the stuff that we want to. Crying, screaming babies, murderous kings, all this stuff. No. We want, what do we want? We want Luke. Give us Luke. Give us Caesar, the census, and Bethlehem, and the innkeeper, and the stable, and the manger, and the shepherds, and the angels. So one week ago, according to Luke's Christmas story, all was calm, all was bright, in the warm, soft glow of candle light. Light. It's so obvious, isn't it, why we omit Matthew's darker side of the Christmas story from our Sunday school Christmas pageants. Oh, we'll give Matthew his due. We'll, show, we'll throw a few wise men in there. That's our bow to Matthew. But other than that, no, no cry of the children, no wail of Rachel, none of that stuff that's not very Christmassy. But there are lessons to be learned in all of the Gospels, and certainly in Matthew's not so Christmassy Gospel as well. This emphasis on a maniacal act of violence upon the most innocent of the innocent. And the lesson to be learned is this that there is a darker side of Christmas. And it's a reminder to us that evil is real and evil happens and evil never takes a Christmas vacation. Never. You dare not ever let down your guard against evil. And even the good tidings of great joy at Christmas cannot stop evil from happening. That's not my sermon from Christmas Eve and you're probably all relieved. But it is my message to you today that wherever the light shines, it shines in darkness. That wherever the light shines, evil is lurking in the shadows. 
It's waiting for an opportune time to manifest itself. Merry Christmas. <laughs> bah humbug. <laughs> you know, we can't, we, we can't even get away from evil in our children's Christmas stories. Think about it. We, we know, instinctually we know that even, even in the beginning we have to warn our children when they're yet very young that evil is all around us. We can do it more playfully. One of the more popular Christmas stories is Dr. Seuss's The Day the Grinch Stole Christmas. Who's the darkness in that story, right? Just north of Whoville lived a Grinch who hated Christmas, hated the light. Why? We don't really know, do we? Some sort of thing about his heart was just too small. What makes hearts that small? Hard to say. But we know this. We have to warn our children. We have to warn our children that the Grinch is there and he wants to come under the guise of Santa to steal the presents and swipe the decorations and stop the bells, stop the bells from ringing in hopes of keeping people from singing joyfully. It's right there in the children's story. Not even something as idyllic as the birth of Christ with its candlelight and silent night and holy night can manage to hold off the darkness for very long. In this case, one week. Last week, candlelight. This week, evil. And before we know it, the Holy Family is on the run, folks. It's on the run. And evil is nipping at their heels. Because hate is strong. And bitterness is real. And greed is rampant. And terror plays havoc with our ordered ways. Even the child or even the child within us will not be spared by or from evil. Even in Christmas. Even Christmas cannot escape the darkness, not for long. So that's the first thing we learn from Matthew's story. Thank you, Matthew, for that. But here's something else we learn. That God is bigger. So I'm going to ask my friend Cheryl. Cheryl, God is bigger than what? The boogeyman. The boogeyman. I think you wrote that to me on a card, didn't you, just lately? Apparently, I've said it enough that some people have actually either have memorized it or at least have come to believe it, that God is bigger. He's always bigger. Scripture puts it this way in Matthew chapter 4. For those who lived in the land of darkness, those who lived in the evil, on them the light has shined. God is bigger. It says this in John's gospel, the one about the light and the darkness. It says, John says, in him, in Jesus was life. That life was what? It was the light of the world. And he goes on and he tells us, he, he assures us that the light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. If you're keeping score, folks, this is the score. Light one, darkness Zero. 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 What does that mean? The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. It means God is bigger. The children massacred in Bethlehem from today's reading, they represent all of us who live under this constant threat of darkness, this constant threat of evil, a constant threat that seeks to extinguish the light around us and within us. But it is the angel of the Lord who appears to Joseph and says, run now. You know, sometimes the best thing is you don't stand and fight. Sometimes you just got to run to fight again another day. And when the angel says, run, you better run. I'm just telling you, 
Run now, he says, take the child, take the mother, escape to Egypt. Because God, the one who is bigger, has a chosen place of refuge for you. It seems like, what chance do you stand against evil? You stand all kinds of opportunities and chances because one, the angel is there to give you the message of God. And two, God is one step ahead of the devil. All the time. Every time. He's got a refuge waiting for you. God will preserve his light. The darkness must not and will not overcome the light because God is bigger. Let me be perfectly clear. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness, according to God's word, his promise, will not overcome it. It may seem like it has, but it won't. Not then, not now. Not ever. That's God's promise. God is bigger. Bigger than the boogeyman. Which leads us to this thought as we put another year behind us. With its joys and its light and its sorrows and its darkness. With its victories and with its defeats. That the greatest weapon that God, that the light gives us to defend ourselves from evil and darkness. The greatest weapon God gives us is hope. Hope, hope, hope. Satan seeks to convince us that our life is hopeless. That's what he's busy doing all the time. Satan knows he cannot, will not win unless somehow he can convince you that your struggle against sin, your struggle against evil, your struggle against death is hopeless. Because you see, hopelessness leads to despair. And this is my experience in life. That despair, a lack of hope, either will drive you closer to God or that despair will drive a wedge between you and God. And there's really not much middle ground there. Now I say by the grace of God, when I despaired, my despair by the grace of God led me deeper into God. A God that I didn't even really know very well at the time. But I can tell you as a pastor over the years, I've seen it happen over and over and over again. I've seen despair drive a wedge between people and God. Hopelessness and despair threaten to sever our relationship with God. Not because God's given up on us, but because we might actually give up on God, who is our true source of hope and salvation. That is why Satan is constantly trying to get us to lose hope. And that is why the message of the gospel, the good news, is always first and foremost God's message of hope. Why do we worship the babe in the manger? Because we hope he is the one who has come to rescue us. Why did Israel long for a Messiah? Because in the midst of hopelessness and despair, they hoped God would fulfill his promise and send his anointed to save them. That has always been the message of the gospel, whether you're talking Old Testament or New Testament. Jesus doesn't just encourage us to place our hope in him. He assures us he promises us that our hope in him is going to be, will be a game changer for us as we face life's challenges and disappointments and as we face Satan's lies and attacks. The psalmist says, this is a person who's in the valley. You know he's in the valley because he's looking out. And in order to look out, he looks up. He says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help, where does my hope come? My help, my hope 
is in the Lord, who is the maker of heaven and earth. Folks, that's not New Testament stuff. That's Old Testament stuff. The Gospels flooded throughout the Old Testament. How does the Lord assure us of the reality of our victory? How do we know that when we place our hope in him, it will be worthy of the hope we place in him? The resurrection. So here's where I'm going to tell you this. What we celebrated a week ago means nothing without Easter. This, all the sentimental stuff about shepherds and angels and babies and mangers, it means nothing without an empty tomb. If there had been all the stuff of Christmas, but there had never been an empty tomb on Easter morning, we would all be without hope. In John's Gospel, it says, Jesus says, I promise to go prepare a place for you, and I will come again to take you to myself, that where I am you may be. He's trying to give us hope. He's making us a promise. I'm going, but I'm coming back. I will take you to be with me forever. Promises are important, but the proof, the assurance of that promise is absolutely necessary. And the assurance of Jesus' promise that I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again to take you to myself is the resurrection. And all we have to do is to look to Peter. Peter the one on whom, the rock upon whom the church is built. Peter is assured of God's promises by the resurrection. Now, no one had greater reason to lose hope. No one had greater reason to give in to despair than the apostle Peter. Peter had betrayed Jesus not once, not twice, three times in his hour of need. And yet it is to Peter that the resurrected Jesus appears in the locked room representing how he's locked away in fear. And it is Jesus who comes in his resurrected form to reveal the truth of his power over death. And through that, he restores Peter's hope. He saves Peter from the same despair that led Judas to hang himself. The fine line between Judas and Peter isn't that one was a greater sinner than the other. The fine line was one gave in to despair and one gave in to hope. We all have that choice to some degree or another. Upon witnessing the resurrected Jesus, it was Peter who wrote these words. In his great mercy, God has given us a new birth. Sounds like a new year, a new opportunity, right? A new birth. He has given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter is what gives you the hope that the promise first established at Christmas is the real deal. The resurrection is God's fulfillment of the promise. It is the resurrection that reassures us that our hope in God is not in vain. This is the message of Christmas, and this is the message I want to give you for the new year. Jesus is your hope. Now, maybe that doesn't mean a hill of beans difference to you right now. But I imagine at some point in the next year, those words, Jesus is your hope, just might mean everything to you. Everything. As we enter a new year, we face again a future that is both darkness and light. We know evil is real. 
We know from experience that Satan will use the trials and tribulations that we will surely experience in the coming year as we live in this sinful world. We know that Satan will try to make us doubt God's love, lose hope in God's power and promise to defend us. Draw close to God in the new year. Draw close through his word because his word is his promise. Draw close to God in worship. When you come here on this first day of the year, you will receive Christ's body given for you, his blood shed for you. On this very first day of the year, God is giving you the word. You have hope because Jesus is your hope. But it's not just the worship of, no, I should say just, it's not only the experience of receiving Christ's body and blood, but it is what you are receiving right now in this Holy Communion. Don't ever lose sight of it. This Holy Communion is it's, it's wonderful and it's important and it's just absolutely critical to our faith journey. But this Holy Communion is too. And as Satan may not be able to convince you that that Holy Communion isn't real, but there will be times when he'll try to convince you that you don't need this Holy Communion. This is where we draw strength from one another. In the coming year, we need to come together. There will be many things that Satan will throw into our midst to divide us in an attempt to conquer us. Don't let him do it. It's just the same old tricks. This is the year that American Lutheran Church draws together in hope and strength. 75 years God has preserved this congregation. 75 years, and 75 years from now, we'll still be going strong. Right? It says in Ecclesiastes, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So, as you pray for your family and yourselves in the coming year, pray for our community of faith. Pray for us. Pray for yourselves. Pray for each other. Pray that God's light will dispel whatever darkness Satan sends our way. Pray that there will be hope in our fellowship. There is power in prayer. And lean mightily on the promise of God that is revealed in his word, that has been proven through his resurrection on Easter day, that the light shines in the darkness, that darkness will not ever overcome it. Amen. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. We'll sing our hymn of the day.
profess our faith with the Christmas creed. I believe in God the Father, who from the heavens God created, sent the Son to save God's fallen world. I believe in Jesus Christ, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, announced by angels, worshipped by shepherds and wise men, who lived to suffer, die, and rise again, to free me from the power of sin and death. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who has brought me to faith in the Christ, and by whose continual work in my heart, I am ever led to lay before the cradle of the Christ my worship, my life, and my love, so that I might live with him and serve him both now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Freely you have received, freely give. of abundance, receive and bless these gifts we have offered. Join our hearts with the song of the angels and gather us at your table of celebration. Strengthen us to share with all the world the abundance of your grace upon grace poured out in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. Amen. On this day of rejoicing, we pray for the life of the church, the world, and all in need. Lord, you are our sure defense. Help us all to cease being worriers about the future and instead become hope-filled warriors who fight the spiritual battle for the souls of the lost through prayers of intercession and by modeling for them God-honoring behavior. With you as our guiding light, we will not be overcome by evil, but can overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy... Hear our Tender Shepherd, we praise you for bringing hope for the helpless and hurting. Many of your lambs are in need of healing, help, and new hope for the days ahead. At this time, lay on our hearts the people you want us to especially minister to during difficult times. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Father of infinite love, we pray for all the children of the world. Bless mothers with strength and wisdom to nurture their children. Bless fathers by giving them shepherding hearts that tenderly care for their children and guide them in godly pursuits. Lord, in your mercy. Joining our voices with your faithful ones in every time and place, 
we offer our prayers in the name of the newborn King, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is our duty. It is our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. It's been given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks. Then he gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It has been shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Hear us now as we pray that prayer that our resurrected Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Come to the banquet, for all is now ready.